think we're going to get started here. I want to thank you for attending this lecture at the Institute of World Politics today. Um, for, those of you are, for those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs and 18 certificates of study. We just added our new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of us or of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Elliot Carlson began his journalistic career in Hawaii, writing editorials for the Honolulu Adver Advertiser. After completing a congressional fellowship that took him to Washington in 1963 through 64, he joined the staff of the Wall Street Journal. Later freelanced from Belgrade, Yugoslavia, and still later served as editor of AARP's monthly newspaper. <laughs> Retiring in 2004, he returned, uh, he turned to biography, writing Joe Rochefort's War, the Odyssey of the Codebreaker, who outwitted Yamamoto at Midway, uh, for which he won the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award for Naval Literature. His latest book, Stanley Johnson's, Johnson's Blunder, The Reporter Who Spilled the Secret Behind the U.S. Navy's Victory at Midway, was published by the Naval Institute Press in October 2017. Carlson holds degrees from the University of Oregon and Stanford. He lives with his wife in Silver Spring, Maryland. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much for that introduction, which I wrote myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, thank the Institute for having me in today, and uh, all of you for coming here to hear me when there are all these burning national security issues roiling the waters from North Korea to Syria to China, which is resurrecting Mount Zedong, I see. And you're, I'm happy you're willing to volunteer to visit with me the security issues of World War II and 76 years ago. I, will want to, I do want to uh, correct the, the title of this talk that was on the web as the secret behind the Navy's victory at Midway. Actually, the correct title is Oh, it's hard to read up there. Spilling the secret behind the Navy's victory at Midway. Uh, this is a book, and this is a talk about a security violation, uh, or the violation of that secret. I think World War II historians lock horns on many things, but if there's one thing that they agree on unreservedly, is that the fight against the Axis powers in World War II would have been a lot tougher and would have been a lot costlier in lives without code breaking. And that was particularly true in the Pacific, where in spring of 1942, uh, the American Navy, Navy capitalists uh, cracked the main operational code of the Imperial Japanese Navy. And uh, that coup made possible uh, the Navy's first, you know, possible for the Navy to deliver uh, Japan its first real setback in the war at the Battle of the Coral Sea. And a month later, in June 42, to deliver uh, Japan a stunning defeat at Midway. In fact, uh, Thanks to code breaking, uh, Admiral Nimitz was able to put ulterior task forces at the right place at the right time and sink four Japanese carriers in just a few hours with against the loss of one carrier in a battle that is generally considered to be the one that turned the tide of war against Japan. So it's hardly surprising that a code breaker's worst nightmare in those days was that someone would, or somehow, their success would be betrayed to the Japanese, or somehow passed on to the Japanese high command, which then would promptly change this crypto system and deprive the Americans of uh, a crucial window 
into Japan's legal activity and movements. Calamitous as such a event would have been, this is what Navy leaders and even President Roosevelt thought had happened in June 1942. That's when a Chicago Tribune reporter named Stanley Johnson pulled off what is probably the biggest intelligence leak to a reporter in naval history, or in American naval history at least. And this was no garden variety slip. Not only did the Roosevelt administration get tied at knots for three months, but as one historian put it, the leak sent in motion a chain of events that culminated in one of the most fantastic fiascos of the war. And this talk in this book is about that fiasco. You might ask, how could this happen? The story begins with the Coral Sea. That great expanse of water east of Australia, where uh, American kilograms a few weeks earlier, in late April, had uh, seen a buildup of Japanese forces around this area, down the, coming down the Solomons, and they gave Nimitz time to deploy two task force carriers to the Coral Sea, one built around New York and one built around the Lexington, to intercept that Japanese armada, which was making its way to Port Moresby, which would have given the Japanese an enormous uh, advantage in that clash with Australia and the Americans in the Southwest Pacific. And uh, the Americans succeeded. They did thwart the uh, Japanese in the Coral Sea, sunk so, a carrier, but it, that uh, victory came at a very heavy price. The, the bombing and the sinking of the carrier of Lexington. If there was one piece of good news to the sinking of that carrier, it was the fact that uh, all 2,700 survivors of the uh, attack on the Lexington survived, were successfully evacuated. And one reason that the evacuation was successful is because of this man. His amazing activity that day, uh, war correspondent Johnston uh, embedded with the Lexington as the battle, battle raged on, he went below deck and pulled sailors out of uh, Bertie Brooms. Uh, he was one of the last men off the ship and uh, later on occupied a whale boat, uh, pulling uh, swimming Lexman out of the water, pulled about 60 out that day. And uh, the task force commander of the of American force, uh, Aubrey Flitch, Aubrey Flitch, uh, sorry, Aubrey Fitch recommended to Nimitz that uh, Johnson even get a medal for his uh, activity that day. Uh, Nimitz endorsed it, the recommendation, sent it to uh, Ernest J. King in Washington for King's approval. King, of course, was the commander of the American Navy in Washington. So just who is Stanley Johnson? Well, even by the exotic standards of war correspondence, uh, Johnson was a bizarre character. He's uh, a native of Australia. He had been a naturalized American citizen for only about six months. He was uh, born in Australia, born in New South Wales. He was a trained engineer, not a journalist. His experience in the news business probably didn't exceed much more than a year. But he was, however, widely traveled as an engineering consultant. He had ranged over Southeast Asia uh, on various freelance jobs. In the early 1930s, he uh, 
was a part owner and he worked in gold mine in New Guinea. Later on, as a rookie entrepreneur in, in Germany, he sold plastic hair curlers to German housewives. So he had a varied experience. Uh, he was amiable, friendly, and he loved to talk about himself and his adventures. And the and the Lexman loved him. He thought they thought he was a great guy, and his uh, his image was enhanced by the fact he was married to a showgirl that he he met in New York, and they uh, she was actually born in Germany herself, and they went to Germany together and toured around, and he started the business there. He had a darker side uh, during his travels in. Western Europe, uh, between uh, the Netherlands and France, the Dutch and the British came to suspect him of being a, a German spy. So he was uh, detained in London, lost his visa, and uh, was under a cloud for quite a while. He cleared himself and uh, presented himself to the London Bureau of the Chicago Tribune, which took mercy on him and, and sent him to Dover as a stringer to cover the, uh, the Blitz, and he did quite well. As an engineer, he mastered uh, military and Navy hardware, knew a lot of stuff about, the, about military equipment. He later makes his way to Chicago and parlays his uh, brief experience into a full-time job with the Tribune. And the Tribune is impressed with his uh, grasp of military issues and hardware and all that, and they uh, sign him to Pearl Harbor to cover the Pacific War, and he ends up embedded with the Lexington, and is caught in the middle of that Coral Sea clash. Well, after that engagement, Johnson is among the 2,700 survivors taken by the rescue ships to Tonga Tabu. Tonga Islands, and there they are reshuffled to uh, this aging transport ship, the, the Barnett, and uh, it's crammed with a thousand Lexman, and the FBI would later call this ship a crime scene. On May 19, Two weeks after the Battle of the Coral Sea, Barnett departs Tonga Tabu on his way to San Diego, where he will deliver these men to, uh, to the mainland and to safety. But three days before reaching San Diego, on May 31st, the Barnett radio team intercepts this message from Admiral Minutes. Uh, this message is, is not to the Barnett, but the uh, Barnett radio men uh, are under instructions to, uh, it's time to decode everything and deliver them to uh, Lexington for their edification. This is a uh, Minutes' heads up to all fleet commanders afloat on what's, what's going to happen in Midway in just a few days. It's a uh, remarkable dispatch with the latest findings from uh, Station Hypo. Uh, Nimitz is being code breaking unit on the main line uh, on, on shore at Oahu. And uh, it includes the name of 12 Japanese ships arrayed to attack Midway. And the ships are arranged in three groups, a striking force, a support force, and an occupation force. The information in this dispatch is momentous. It is derived from the, the hypo team, which just earlier had identified Midway as the Japanese Navy's target. The finding gives Nimitz a remarkably detailed picture of the Japanese forces assembling. And uh, this message, with all this valuable information in it, is delivered to uh, the suite occupied by this man. This is uh, Morton Seligman. He 
is the executive officer of the Lexington and the highest ranking Lexington officer on the Barnett. And he has a big suite. And uh, Seligman likes Johnston. They have become pals over the weeks. And uh, he not only befriends Johnston, but he gives him a spare bunk in this nice big suite. So Schlickman's quarters are popular. Uh, it's the ship's watering hole. Lexington officers who are cooped up in various parts of the Barnett show up throughout the day to socialize, drink coffee, and catch up on the news. This is that sweet. Um, lots of stuff happens here. Gondon's uh, bunk is here. And this is the table where uh, everything happens. That's the crime scene. The uh, dispatch that is brought in, dis dis dispatch known in the Navy circles as 311-221, is brought to Seligman while they are sitting at that table. And uh, he, he does things he's not supposed to do. He uh, knows the men, he knows the men need information. Uh, he uh, breaks his old rules, breaks Navy security rules by sometimes reading aloud from these messages, and sometimes he copies parts of them on pieces of paper, leaves them on that table. Sometimes he passes the dispatch around the table, even to those who are cleared for uh, security information. But Johnson is always there. He's always walking around. He's socializing. Everybody likes him. Well, they are now a little bit being a little suspicious, but they know about these secret dispatches, and they see Johnson. And some of them actually scratch their head and wonder if Johnson should be there. But he's, uh, he's always within the earshot of the officers. This room, you might say, is a reporter's dream. Well, into this bustling mix, uh, Nemesis Dispatch arrives. And uh, Sleepman later tells the FBI he has no recollection of ever seeing this particular dispatch. Uh, but other officers who were at the table and re remember that day have a different memory. They recall seeing a little piece or, or a large piece of uh, blue line paper on that table. And they notice that it has on it 12 Japanese ships named all. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, divided in three groups, a support force, a striking force, and an occupation force. What they're looking at, of course, is a copy that the Navy later surmises and the FBI surmises that Seligman carelessly has copied onto that blue line piece of paper and left it on his table. And the officers who uh, see it there um, see Johnson in the room, but they admit later on that they lose track of that piece of paper. They don't know what happens to it. It disappears. The transport ship Barnett docks at San Diego on June 2. And five days later, the Washington Times Herald runs this story on page 4. Is a story read by Admiral King in Washington, and what catches his eye is that headline that the U.S. Navy knew in advance about the Japanese attack. And then King is shown this paper, the Sunday Chicago Tribune. Of course, it has the, the good news about the uh, America's defeat of uh, Japan at Midway. Don't have all the carriers there, but it's treated as a huge victory, and it should be. But in the middle, King can't help but notice. Everybody, everybody in the Navy Department notices that story. It's the same story that King read in the Washington Times Herald. Well, this time it has a Washington date line on it. It has no byline, and the information in it is attributed to uh, naval intelligence sources in Washington. That uh, Bobbitt's king. <coughs> K 
king now does what he is famous for doing. He blows up. He was notorious for having a low voting point. And those who were on the scene at that time say he, this, this eruption was, a, was one of King's most violent reactions during the entire war. The headlines were bad enough, but even more infuriating to King was that the information in the two stories were essentially the same story. Exactly paralleled Nemesis dispatch of May 31st. The same 12 ships in roughly the same order, the same misspellings, and King believes there has been a horrendous, potentially catastrophic leak. Now, the story didn't say that the Americans had broken the Japanese code, but the Navy's admirals, King and his colleagues, believe that any intelligent reader will come to that conclusion. And they fear the story will find its way to the Japanese and cause them to change their code and install a new code that would take months to break if it could be broken at all and therefore deprive the Americans of a priceless advantage in the Pacific War. So one admiral, I believe it was Admiral Savvy Cook, a very sassy guy on King's staff, uh, calls the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, that was Robert McCormick, a traitor. And he declares that uh, this admiral should be prosecuted, put behind bars, tried for treason. Well, King isn't the only official who's boiling mad. So is President Roosevelt. The arch-conservative McCormick has been a thorn in the FDR side since the beginning of the, of the New Deal. Uh, the Tribune has editorialized that uh, the New Deal is a, is a conspiracy to subvert the American way of life. Uh, the, the Tribune supports the America First Committee, which wants to keep America out of Europe and Asia and uh, play, play no role in, in helping these countries defend themselves from uh, Axis power aggression. Uh, the Tribune even, whoops, the Tribune even uh, called FDR a warmonger. So by June of 42, Roosevelt has had enough. He tells his staff he wants to be prosecuted and put behind bars. Roosevelt orders FBI Director Hoover to mount a massive investigation into this leak. And Hoover launches a probe to uh, find out how the Nemesis message passed from Navy hands into Johnson's hands. Because by this time, Nobody has any doubt that it was Johnson who wrote the story. Uh, King has confirmed that Johnson was on the Barnett when it docked in San Diego. So that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, Johnson is singled out as the culprit of this. And in fact, that is correct. He is the guy who wrote the story. And uh, so G-Men fanned out across the country to interview uh, Barnett and uh, uh, let survivors. And, at least 12 or 13 cities around the country. King's own probe uh, ends as of Sunday, June the 7th. He has established Johnson as the author, and he has gotten very disconcerting news about Sullivan's security habits. So uh, King is, uh, is, a, is mad about a lot of things. And, uh, so King prevails upon McCormick. Uh, strangely enough, to uh, who was actually kind of cooperative, to send Johnson to Washington to be grilled by King's admirals. And Johnson shows up the next day, June 8th, one day after the story appeared. And he tells admirals two different stories at two different meetings. First, he denies that he saw Nemesis dispatch or saw any list Imperial Navy ships. He says he got all his information out of Jane's fighting ships, <laughs> which is a ship encyclopedia, which he says is his Bible. He reads it all the time and carries it around, and, uh, and his own vast knowledge of the Japanese Navy. 
Well, the admirals roll their eyes when they hear this, and they dismiss him. So when Johnson hears later from his Tribune colleagues that the admirals didn't buy his story, he returns to the Navy Department later in the day, and he sees King's chief of staff, this is Admiral Russell Wilson, and he tells Wilson a different story. Unfortunately, Wilson doesn't have a sonographer there, he doesn't have a tape recorder, he has it's just Johnston on, on Wilson. And uh, so there's, there's no way to confirm who said what. But in this meeting, even Johnson will admit in a memo he wrote about the meeting that he had seen some kind of list of Japanese warships and that he says he came across it accidentally on his desk on the uh, barnet. And when he was cleaning up his papers to leave the ship on June 2nd, he came across this piece of blue line paper um, which had written on it the names of a bunch of Japanese warships under the headings of striking force, support force, occupation force. And then he adds a kicker in his own memo to his uh, boss. I copied the names off that list. So uh, that looks pretty incriminating. Well, Johnson's confession, it seems like a confession, and he recants it later, doesn't quell the Navy's fury or Roosevelt's. FDR directs Navy Secretary Frank Knox, that's Knox on the left, to help the Justice Department build a case against McCormick. But Knox is only too happy to oblige. By one of those strange quirks, uh, McCormick and Knox are newspaper rivals in Chicago. McCormick publishes the Morning Tribune, and Knox publishes the Afternoon Daily News. How's that for a conflict of interest? <laughs> so, not only are they competitors, but they are bitter enemies. The two men detest each other. So on June 9, two days after Johnson's story appears, Knox urges Attorney General Francis Biddle to take immediate action to obtain an indictment or indictments against Johnson and other Tribune staffers who uh, might be deserving of an indictment and do so under the Espionage Act of 1917. That law makes it a crime to publish secret information pertaining to national defense. If convicted, Johnson could face a fine up to $10,000 and be in prison up to 10 years. That's his middle. On August 7th, this is two months later, and all this while Hoover is investigating like crazy, building the case. So quite, a, quite some time has passed. But in August 7th, uh, Biddle convenes a grand jury in Chicago to investigate the publication by the Tribune and client papers of confidential information concerning the battle in Midway. Uh, this probe will mark the first time, and it will be the only time in American history that the Justice Department has sought to prosecute a newspaper or a reporter for violating the Espionage Act by printing leaked classified information. So it's a milestone. Biddle recruits William Mitchell, a prominent New York lawyer, and a former attorney general under President Hoover to oversee the case. Mitchell agrees to take the case but on one condition, and that is that he will be able to present the grand jury evidence or witnesses who will attest to the, uh, the damage done national security by the Tribune article. Well, he is assured, Mitchell is assured by Biddle, who has been assured by Frank Knox, who swears he has it from Admiral King, that Navy Crypt analysts based in Washington will appear in Chicago to appear as witnesses to attest to the damage done national security by the Tribune story. The trouble is, by the time Mitchell starts taking testimony from witnesses on August 13, Admiral King and his sub admirals have had a change of heart. They've had second thoughts about the advisability of proceeding with this matter. They think if by chance the Japanese missed the original story, they will not miss the furor <coughs> 
that would surround a public trial. And your concerns are reinforced by all the media attention this matter is now getting. And your anxiety mounts when radio gossip commentator Walter Winchell talks about stuff he is not supposed to know about. He talks about, on one of his radio shows, the role played by intercepted messages in a recent naval battle. Nobody's supposed to know that. Well, King fears this type of coverage will escalate should there be a trial. Worse is yet to come. When Biddle convenes the grand jury, the Tribune counterattacks. It launches a series of sharp edge, hard-hitting articles accusing Biddle and, and Knox of having bad motives playing politics, of being driven by um, first kind of partisan motivation, and in the case of Knox, acting out of greed, desire to get rid of a rival. Lawmakers debate the case in Congress. The story is nationwide news. The whole Johnson affair has turned into a media circus. The circus atmosphere is heightened when, during the third day of grand jury testimony, Johnson and Tripp managing editor J. Loy Pat Maloney, and Maloney is also a target of the Justice Department, show up at the courthouse uninvited, and they plead for a chance to address the grand jury. They beg that they be allowed to tell their side of the story. And at first, Mitchell turns them down. They, they weren't supposed to be on the agenda. But Mitchell, a day later, rethinks that decision, says, well, maybe I better bring them in. And they come in on August 18th. They tell jurors they intended no harm. Uh, as far as that, is, that list that Johnson says he wrote down, he says, it was just a couple of names, but I already knew all those ships. I just wrote that down to check the spelling. I was already well aware of all those ships. And, uh, it was not news to me. It was, it was nothing at all. Don't pay any attention to that story about the list. And uh, they say their motivation in running the story was to uh, reflect glory on the American Navy. That was what they wanted to do. And uh, um, oops, excuse me. Now, Maloney is there because he's the guy who edited the story. He uh, put the Washington date line on it. He attributed it to uh, naval intelligence in Washington. And then he uh, skirted the censorship. A, a whole different subject here is a censorship system that existed back then. And uh, the story was required to be uh, reviewed, and it was not reviewed. It was 11 o'clock at night, and Maloney just shoved it into the paper. And uh, he, he looked up and read the uh, the provisions under the under the censorship code it says this story doesn't apply. It's different. And uh, what the jurors thought of these two men, they never said. They were waiting for a bigger testimony from uh, key witnesses. Those that were expected that the next day on the 19th. These were the Navy code breakers that uh, uh, Knox had promised. Hitler promised Knox and Knox had promised Mitchell. Mitchell and so forth, to explain to the jurors the damaging effects of the Tribune story. But on August 19, the grand jurors surprised everybody. They threw out the case. They threw out the case when the expert witnesses that Knox had promised and uh, Mitchell expected failed to appear in Chicago. They were absent because Knox, without consulting Mitchell or Biddle, has held them back. He's held them back at the stern insistence of Admiral King, who has reversed himself 180 degrees on this matter. He and his fellow admirals believe a whole lot more harm will be done if we go ahead with this. We just let the matter drop. And uh, the jurors are astounded. They are being asked to indict Johnson and Maloney not being told how the crime that they were said to have committed damaged national defense. And they are disgusted with the uh, whole case, and uh, they return no indictment. 
the case is closed. Now, uh, Mitchell is furious, and he faults Knox for the debacle, but Knox's explanation of what he did is pretty sensible. He later came up, tells uh, Biddle and uh, Biddle and Mitchell that uh, maybe cryptanalysts, as of August, middle part of August, were again reading Japanese messages without any problem. The decoders were decoding. It looked like the Japanese had not changed their code after all, and no harm had been done. So why take this matter any further? And uh, so with the case closed, Johnson and Maloney returned to their jobs at the Tribune. They are celebrated as heroes. When they walk into the newsroom, they get standing applause. McCormick walks, in, walks into the newsroom, he gets standing applause. Uh, Johnson has a job for life. So no one is punished for this leak. But the only loser in this case is Commander Morton Saluton, who has incurred King's wrath and is blamed by King for lax security that permitted Johnson to obtain Nimitz's super secret dispatch. So Lickman never again serves in a combat zone. Badly banged up during the Battle of the Coral Sea, he is reassigned to shore duty, and with his health bursting, he is given a medical discharge in 1944. That's the end of Seligman. He's never heard from again. Well, what are we to make of Stanley Johnson? Does his story have any larger meaning? Does it relate to anything going on today? The case certainly provides a fascinating glimpse into the politics and personalities of the Roosevelt administration. Also, of nothing else, it seems to me, Johnson diverges as a kind of pioneer. His brush with criminal law foreshadows the far more adversarial relationship between journalists and the government that we have today. And you might say that his uh, case makes comparison with big league leakers today. One thinks of Ellsberg and Snowden. There were some similarities between Johnston and these two gentlemen. There also make some differences. Uh, one is a matter of intent. Uh, Elzeberg and Snowden intended to disclose the information they disclosed. Uh, and they were bound by other rules and other laws. They, were, they swore they would obey secrecy laws. Uh, Johnson did not intend to betray a secret. He just wanted a scoop. And he saw this piece of paper. He thought it was pretty important. He knew enough about the Navy to know that this, this information was juicy and would be a good sidebar for the Tribune. So I refer to him or think of him as more of an accidental leaker than an intended leaker. And uh, he certainly does uh, anticipate these two gentlemen, um, he, if there was an antecedent to Ellsberg and Soden, it would be St St Stanley Johnson. But did this leak, did Johnson's blunder really matter? Well, I think it did. If the Japanese had seen the story and drawn the obvious conclusion, results could have been catastrophic. If the Japanese had changed their code, the war could have lasted much longer and many more lives would have been lost. But in the wake of Johnson's leak, the Navy caught a break. While the Japanese now modified their code from time to time, they never abandoned their basic crypto system. They started the war with a system called JN25B, and by the end of the war, they had reached JN25P. This is still the same basic system. Well, how did the Japanese miss this? How did this, how did this big story not come to their attention? <clears throat> well, King's biographer, Thomas Buell, has a theory. He mused, the Japanese apparently did not read American newspapers. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I will be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> but, but before I do, I want to add a footnote. 
do what I just said, and uh, how I got the story. Uh, the Chicago Tribune gave me full access to their entire archive. I spent the better part of a week in Wheaton, Illinois, going through 60 boxes and some 2,000 pages of material to get all these memos and all this material from the Tribune side. So the Tribune was very generous in uh, uh, helping me out. Uh, I also got through the Freedom of Information Act, the FBI's entire file on this subject. Every interview, they did dozens of interviews over two months with every uh, uh, Lexington and Barnett officer they could find. And I got all their, uh, all that, all those good interviews. But of particular importance, which I must brag about, uh, the grand jury testimony that was sealed in 1942 and was supposed to be sealed forever uh, was obtained by me last December after a two-year court fight with the Department of Justice. And uh, they didn't want the, these documents, this grand jury testimony release, just because grand jury testimony is supposed to be sacred. Uh, I had immense help in getting this material by a group called the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. It has an office just down the street here. They were an amazing group. Uh, they're not well known. They're uh, uh, funded by donations. But they took on my case, and their litigation director uh, did the whole thing practically by herself and uh, outwitted, I would say, uh, four or five Justice Department lawyers who were arrayed against her. So I feel very kindly toward the Reporters Committee. And that's all I have. I want to thank you for your attention, and I would answer any questions you have. Yes. We talked earlier about the book by the uh, Michael Smith, and there was a mention in that book of a similar kind of leak that it, it never got the kind of press, I, I guess, wasn't much about it in Smith's book, but that occurred right after the Coral Sea battle, basically saying, you know, we knew the composite, we knew the Japanese were coming from Rebel or wherever the base was, headed for Port Mosby. Fort Moresby. What do you know about that? What, what was the background Well, that? I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, if the British capitalists uh, knew about it. I mean, they're, they're good. And they were, at this time, moving from the Philippines to Australia. And they could have uh, been aware as, this is aware as, as Station Hypo was. I'm not aware of any leak, though. That came out about the Coral Sea. One thing about uh, the Americans, we talk about secrecy. Uh, the Americans who were on board the Lexington and the Yorktown were forbidden to talk about uh, the Coral Sea battle. And uh, so when the Lexington survivors arrived in San Diego, they were sworn to secrecy about what had happened at the Coral Sea. And uh, the Americans didn't officially release the news of the sinking of the Lexington till around June 13, which is at least five weeks after the sinking. So, okay. Yes. Yeah, when you look into the FOIA or any information, whether public or private, how do you know whether that is true or not? Well, what is true? The information you obtain, whether, whether it's from FBI or, or somewhere else, because a lot of information has been tempered or destroyed or redacted. Actually, the information I got was not redacted. Nothing was destroyed. I got, I got, uh, I got virtually uh, the entire FBI file uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, 2,000 pages from that source. And, I, and, it was, and it was blown through with a fine tooth comb by the FOIA people at the National Archives. And I don't think they removed more than a dozen lines, maybe 20 lines from the entire, from the entire file. So very little was redacted. Now remember, this is 75 years ago. So there's no real reason to redact anything at this point. So, uh, and of course, I have the Tribune files. And you cross-check back and forth to see, make sure things match up. 
And then, of course, I had what little testimony there was at the grand jury. You take that testimony and match it up with your other sources. And if they all match, you're pretty close to having something resembling the truth. So uh, I believe that this is a correct story. Yes? Well, I certainly don't want to flog a dead horse, but I think that raises raises a very interesting question was why they did redact those very few lines. Why did what? You said that in the end they did redact a few lines. Oh, yeah. Just now. I mean, that just right. raises a whole new set of yeah. questions. Why in the world did they do that now? You know, it's, a, it's an odd thing. Uh, one thing they redacted was... Uh, Frank Knox's letter to Mitchell and uh, uh, to William Mitchell. Uh, Knox's letter explaining why he held the uh, code breakers back from going to Chicago. And uh, it's very, very juicy parts there, I knew were juicy, were, were, were redacted, that gave uh, uh, Knox's motivations. Well, if you go over to the, uh, the History Center at the Navy Yard, now called Navy Heritage and History Center, or History and Heritage Center, uh, and you go to the Knox file, look up Knox's letters, that same letter is there unredacted. <laughs> <laughs> I have the whole letter uh, unredacted, and it's in the last chapter of my book. So I have all of Knox's thinking on that, although if I... If I depended on FOIA, I would not have had it. But you know, if you're a researcher, you got to go everywhere and look at every piece of paper. And I'm kind of a nut about looking at every piece of paper I can get my hands on. And that's the story of that one. Yes? This is a dumb question. I don't know enough about it. But when did the, they announce the names of the ships that were sunk, the Japanese ships at Midway? I mean, could they have said, oh, well, I got the names of the ships because you publicized it afterwards? Um, could Johnson have said, I was simply reading official announcements? Yeah. Well, there were, um, by the time this Tribune story came out, they only saw two carriers, so, and in fact, there were four so. So there were many more names okay. in that dispatch and it was in the press at that time. Uh, we didn't know how many carriers we sunk until at least two or three weeks later. It didn't dawn on us, wow, this is really an amazing thing. And Nimitz didn't know until very late this that, the, that the fourth carrier had gone down. So uh, I don't think so. I don't think there would have been that. Was there any, was there any inquiry as to why um, Nimitz felt it was worthwhile to distribute all of this information so broadly, you're, you're, if it's a secret? <laughs> this, is a good, this is a good point. Now, uh, let's go back to that. There, oops, there, uh, it's damn secret. Mm -hmm. uh, that should tell somebody something that this is not to be circulated not to be, uh, but that's that's not the highest uh, level of secrecy, though. I mean, is it? I mean, as far as I listen, when I was doing a book on Rochefort a few years ago, I went through dozens of sink pack dispatches, and I never saw one stamped top secret. As far as I know, this was the highest classification available to Nimitz. Now, I don't know why it should have made a difference if it was stamped stamp top secret, because secret is still secret. Um, but as far as I know, this information couldn't have been any more sensitive than this. You couldn't have anything more sensitive than this. And that was the classification available. Um, so I don't really have a better answer to that than your question. I thought what you were going to ask me, why did Nimitz even put out that dispatch no, in the that, first place. That was my question. Oh, okay. Yeah, why, why, why was this distributed? Why not just deliver that information yeah. directly to right. uh, uh, Ralph Sprague? Yeah, 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 he, he, he wanted to give his, uh, and his, his commanders afloat a heads up 
on what was going to happen in, in just a few days. He wanted to make him aware. I know. He wasn't afloat. He was sunk. <laughs> and uh, he thought he was. He thought he was uh, communicating on a secure line. Now the the baronet was not an addressee of this message, but when Seligman and the Lexington came on board the Barnett, uh, Seligman talked to Captain of the Barnett into letting his his own radio men uh, work in the radio room and do the decryption of St. Pat messages so he could keep the Lexington up to date on news. And uh, Seligman overdid it. He, he, he took, by several light years, and uh, but normally that the Barnett captain left to his own devices would even have bothered with this message. He would have noted it was there, not addressed to him, and he would have, as he told Sligman originally, I don't have enough staff to decode all these messages. And Sligman said, I'll give you my staff. I'll give you my radio man. So this was addressed by all task force commanders. Was what, how many how many task groups were there? You know, I don't know. I don't. I, uh, I don't know how many there were. Uh, not a heck of a lot. Not all that many. Uh, there was uh, one up in the Aleutians area. Uh, there might have been a couple of others, but there weren't that many. Uh, you're, I, I really don't know why he felt he had to put this out. I think it, it could have been dispensed with. This is uh, yeah, this is Nimitz trying to be a, a communicator, keep his uh, People up to date, what was going on? He wanted to put them in the put them in the picture, and this was his way of doing it. And he he probably overdid it. And in fact, King wrote uh, uh, bring out in the book. Uh, King wrote Nimus a very sharp note, a very sharp memo, uh, saying that you're going to have to upgrade your your security sensitivity, and that use a different. Uh, Radio stream because this stream uh, that you use blasted this information all over the United States. So uh, King did take minutes to, to task. One of King's strong points is that unlike many uh, top admirals, he was a strong believer in code breaking. He was a complete champion of uh, hip analysis and he was just horrified by this whole thing. And, uh, but uh, her question's a good one. That's right. Obviously, no one was following the need to know principle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we still do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, look at Snowden and Manning, two mm -hmm. relatively low level people right. that had access to way more information than they needed. Uh, King radar. didn't think it was going to low level. I mean, Nimitz didn't think it was going to low level people. He thought it was going to his, his admirals, his commanders, task force commanders around the Pacific. Not all that many. He used the word task force commanders afloat, not those who were ashore. So this is pretty safe. And some of them might be brought into the uh, into the game. Now, of course, among those who would have gotten it would have been Frank Jack Fletcher uh, on the Yorktown. Uh, Mitchell, the battle hadn't happened yet. Uh, Mitchell would have got it. Um, Policy would have got it. Spruance at this point hadn't been elevated to uh, replace Halsey, but you can say possibly Spruance because he was uh, uh, commanding cruisers with Halsey's team. So a relatively small group, and yet this, this fleeting message passes through the Barnett's radio system, and uh, the, they, the radio men copy it. They put it in a Loose leaf notebook, cellophane over it, everything very safe. They deliver it to uh, Seligman's suite, and the watch officer is supposed to, in theory, is supposed to stand and watch and uh, make sure that uh, he's not supposed to let that message out of his sight. And, but Seligman outranks that guy, and uh, Seligman can do whatever he wants to do. And the, uh, the Navy officers who were there, some of whom were appalled by the carelessness of this. Uh, oops. 
see that uh, the Ligman's gotten very promiscuous. And it was the Ligman's initiative that led the captain of the Barnett to let his own guard down and let these items be circulated, not just to Seligman, but to three other uh, top officers of Seligman's crew, the, the uh, engineering head, the communication head, uh, the aviation head, of what had been the Lexington team. And so the watch officer goes all over the Barnett with this loose leaf notebook and shows them, and they have to initial it, they all initial it. And when they bring it back to the radio room, it's supposed to be burned. And in this instance, they don't burn it in the safe. So when uh, King begins his own probe, uh, they, up, they clear out the contents of the safe. And this is the uh, message that the dispatch that is there, and uh, which reveals what landed on the Barnett. But it has a ligament signature on it, so he admits, I must have seen it. And uh, he doesn't remember seeing it. But he was terribly uh, banged up. And uh, his back was, was destroyed, really. And uh, so, so after the war, or I'm not sure, after uh, the Coral Sea, after Midway, uh, King puts him in charge of the aviation, Naval Aviation Center in Peru, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Peru is a pretty long way from the Pacific. <laughs> so he can't do any harm in Peru. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you.